And now it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome our morning keynote speaker, TJ Shear. TJ is the president and founder of Smart Restaurant Group, a large which, which superior sandwiches franchisee. TJ draws from his personal experiences to create training programs on topics such as building a team of top performers, hiring, customer service, and systems. TJ has written numerous books and authored over 100 articles on guest service and motivating today's generation. And nearly 50 of you in the audience have signed up for his interactive workshop tomorrow on the seven essential systems for small business success. Please join me in welcoming TJ Shear. All right, good morning, thank you. Thank you, so thank you. good morning. All right, you guys are probably wondering why you're having to listen to a sandwich franchisee in Texas. So I'll, I'll use a little bit of an analogy. A friend of mine is a principal in a high school, and he had problems with girls putting lipstick prints on the mirror. So he did as any principal would or any of us as a business owners do when your employees break the rules. We tell everybody not to do that. Now, what happens when you tell your kids, you tell your employees, or in this case, he tells the students not to do something? What happens? You're going to do more of it. They do more of it. So the lipstick prints keep showing up in the mirror. So one day the janitor comes into the principal's office and he says, look, just send a group of girls down to the restroom. I will fix your problem. So Mr. Smith, the principal, sends some girls down to the restroom. The girls are in there laughing at him. He's just the janitor. They don't really care. It's a pretty prestigious school. They're the entitled generation. And the janitor says, ladies, I know you don't care about me. Let me just show you what I have to do to fix the lipstick print. So he takes a squeegee, dips it in the dirty toilet bowl, goes over to the mirror and wipes off all the lipstick prints. All right, I'm going to be your janitor today, okay? Sometimes you just have to ask somebody a little bit different than the expert that you think you are to solve your problem like the principal did. So what I want to do today is start off with a little video. If you've seen this, please don't say anything, but just to kind of frame everything of what we're going to do today, there are three people in white shirts there are three people in black shirts in this video. Silently to yourself, do not say anything out loud, silently to yourself, count how many times the people in the white shirts bounce the ball. All right, we're going to get the same answers, I assume. How many times did the people in the white shirts bounce the ball? Ten. Ten. Did anybody get a different number? Eleven. Anything else? Nine. Eight. I, I do this in Vegas a lot. They'll say 14, 18, because they're seeing double from being out all night and those kind of things. The, the correct, there's two reasons I show this video. The first is we all watch the same video. We heard nine, ten, eleven, eight. The correct answer is 10 or 11. There's one point where the ball bounces off somebody's head. So 10 or 11 to me is the acceptable answer. Now, the second reason I show this video is because how many of you all that have never seen this video saw the gorilla that was in it? Maybe, maybe eight. Now, the other 95% of you are wondering right now, what gorilla, correct? So, in fairness, I will show this again, okay? Now, why did 95% of us miss the gorilla on the screen? You are so focused on what you're doing. There's another bounce, there's another bounce. There is the gorilla that comes across the stage and walks off the side. Now, that is a 25-second video clip. The gorilla was in the video for eight seconds, and 95% of you missed it. First off, kudos to you all to be here, because we get so focused on what we do day to day, we miss the gorilla. We're just so focused on taking care of our business that we miss the obvious opportunities. This is one of those opportunities to learn and grow. So what I want to do is share a little bit about my background. I actually spent 18 years working at Chuck E. Cheese Pizza. Anybody ever been there? <laughs> Voluntarily? Okay. Uh, yeah, right, you gotta go. 
I, I did the 18 years there. I, I took a year of rehab to kind of get, get down from that situation. But I've spent the last 18 years consulting and working with companies such as the ones you see here on hiring and training and building teams of top performers to move service forward, to build their business. Now, what I did about the last 12 years, in addition to speaking and doing these things, is I have my own small business. You've probably never heard of which, which is about a 400-unit sandwich chain. It is very, very, very different than Subway and some of the other sandwich places in that we have 50 different sandwiches with 47 different toppings. You come in and you fill out a bag. So it's very counterintuitive. We're a small business franchised operation. I like to tell everybody I have seven witch witches, but actually what I really do, and business owners can relate to this, I have, I have five witch witches and two nonprofits, okay? So you guys get that right? So there's a couple write-offs of charities in there. I, I literally do this, what you all do each and every day. Now, the reason I hope I'm here for you between today and tomorrow is my Witch Witch locations do 30 to 40% higher sales than the other franchise Witch Witch locations in my market. I live in Dallas, Texas. I've got a couple stores in Houston. I have a couple stores outside of Austin. Our sales trend is 3 to 4% better than all of the other Witch Witches in our areas as well because we have figured out how to operationalize and systematize everything that we're doing to replicate and grow and take care of our guests a little better. And what I want to do is share that with you. Now, I know you're sitting out here thinking, well, my business is pretty good. And I'm going to rewind about 12 years ago when I met this company and started working with them. This is actually a real 1,100 square foot drive through only restaurant in Kingsport, Tennessee called PALS, P-A-L-S, Sudden Service. They were the first restaurant in the U.S. to win the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award, which is the highest business award that you can win. They were the second hospitality company after the Ritz-Carlton. Very, very difficult to win this award. They now own 29 restaurants. They have nobody that works at their corporate office. There is nobody above store-level managers other than the founder, the president, and administrative assistant. There is no overhead. So when I started working with them trying to grow my small business into a bigger business, I thought, wow, if they can do this, they're doing $2.3 million in a 1,100-square-foot drive through only restaurant. They've been up in sales 30 years in a row. They are a small business. They're in the eastern part of Tennessee. They compete with McDonald's and Burger King and Sonic and all the other chains that are around. Just like many of us in this room, we compete against the big behemoth brands. It's tough. 2% manager turnover, 38% employee turnover, and they make one mistake for every 3,700 orders. The crazy thing is they push 200 cars an hour through a single lane drive through it's amazing. And what I learned from them is there is a system for everything. They have a recipe for every single thing that they do in our business. And as entrepreneurs, a lot of times we kind of wing it. You know, we think we know better and we've kind of just created off the cuff. And we think we know better than our fellow business person down the street and those kind of things. But they've learned if you want to replicate success, you have to put systems into place. And it's amazing. So as I built my business, I started to focus on them. And FYI, this, this uh, screen down here is not working, just in case anybody um, down here, the cheat, the cheat screen's not working. Okay? I got to know what I'm talking about. So I spent 18 years at Chuck E. Cheese, got out of rehab. I spent 18 years as a speaker and a consultant, 12 years as a franchisee. This is the single silver bullet that you will need to take home from today. Here is the success formula. Okay? You got it? Everybody figure that out? My son's a mechanical engineer. He looked at it the other day. He said, Dad, the answer to that question is six. Okay, I, I, have, I believe him because he, he knows better than I do. Now, I love talking about my kids. They're 25 and 23. I gave them biblical names. My daughter's Mary Catherine, and my son is Satan. Okay? All right? All right. Sorry. That's not true. Okay? That's not true. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to walk you through these seven systems. We are here for a very short time. We have a panel of 
three business owners locally that are going to come up and talk to us about some of these uh, as well. And then we've got a breakout session tomorrow or a workshop for some of you all that are here. And some of the things are going to be talked about even in more detail like Google and some of these things. So I'm going to kind of give you the high-level overview. I'll be happy to then go into more details or answer any questions later today. But I want to start with mission. And it's one of those things. How many of you all as a small business owner have a mission? Just a few more than saw the gorilla, so that's good. Okay, we're getting more hands up. I would urge you that if you don't, you really need to. And I'll do a simple exercise, okay? Everybody, just close your eyes. Close your eyes and point what direction you believe north is and hint it's not straight up in the air, okay? So just point what direction you think north is. All right, everybody open your eyes, keep your hands where they're pointed. North is this way, okay? Now, this was not a geography lesson, but the, the reason I do this is if all of the people that work for you do not understand what your true north is, what direction we are going, you're not going to be successful. And you're on an island, so it should be a little bit easier to kind of know the direction, right? But I, I run sandwich places. It should be very easy for an employee to know, in my case, take care of the guest. The guest is always right. Some of those things that you've ever heard, right? So, uh, Starbucks, although I think they should change their name to Five Bucks, but Starbucks <laughs> actually sews their, their mantra into the insides of their apron. And it's a little bit hokey, but what happens is when the employee puts on that green iconic apron, the last thing they see in front of their eyes is we create inspired moments in each customer's day anticipate, connect, personalize, own. Those are kind of the pillars of how they do that. You have to have that clarity as a business owner because how do you tell your employees what to do, why we're doing it, and those kind of things? So the biggest, most successful brands in the world are doing this, and this is very, very easy for us as a starting point to give us some direction. It's like when we use a MapQuest right now, if we don't know, or the app on our phone, if we don't know where we're going, there's many ways to get there. But if we have that direction and we know, it makes it easy. Mine was simple, make the guests say wow. Because when we opened our first Witch Witch in 2007, it was very new to the area. I can't tell you, most of the guests said holy bleep when they came in there because they couldn't fit. Oh my gosh, it was overwhelming. But we heard the word wow so much. That became the natural mantra for us. Make the guests say wow. So when the little devil pops up on the shoulder and the little angel pops up, when the guest brings a coupon into my business that's not from my restaurant or it's already expired, I want the little angel to just say, make the guests say wow. When my employees misbehave or do something incorrectly, as an example, I got an email one day that says, I went to your restaurant at 8.55, the sign says you close at 9 and the doors were locked. I would like to think that never happens in my restaurants, but what happens is I call Scooter up and I say, hey, Scooter, what, what were you doing last night? Oh, I was trying to save labor. As a business owner, we can appreciate them trying to save a few pennies for us, right? I said, what's our mantra? Make the guests say wow. What does locking the door early have to do with making the guests say wow? Well, I was trying to save you money. Hey, I appreciate that. Follow the mission. And everything that you do, people, product, facility, has to fall under and reinforce that mission. I got to speak in the Dominican Republic a couple months ago, and I was walking out to the pool at the Hard Rock Hotel, and I saw this. Now, this is absolutely the dumbest thing in the world. But what is the hard rock all about? Guitar. Rock and roll and guitars, right? And when you walk out to the pool and you see this, what is everybody doing? They stop. They kind of go over there, grab their fictitious guitar, and they're playing. Now, this won't work in my restaurant. It won't work in your company. But when you go through the Hard Rock Hotel, and this, this one had a casino, and above the ATM it says, go on, take the money and run, Steve Miller. The wet floor sign said, slippery when wet, Bon Jovi. Every interaction their customer has with their business reinforces who they are. If you as a business owner do not have that mission, that mantra, how can you reinforce it with your customers? How can you reinforce it with your clients or your employees? 
It doesn't have to be elaborate. Mine was make the guests say, wow. Columbia University, we work with them. They are the number one ranked dining facility. They used to be number three, and they fought and fought and fought to get to number one. It's the power of one. The power of one. Just what one thing can you do? It's simple. It doesn't have to be elaborate. So start there because otherwise it makes everything else different, difficult. Now we need to operationalize that. Once we have the direction that we're going, we need to get there. I love phone apps now because you can get anywhere from A to B much, much simpler than the old days. How many of you all are old enough to remember having to pull out a map and try and fold the thing back up together, right, to get it back in your glove compartment? Good, no traffic, no accidents, you didn't know anything. It's so much easier today because we have that technology. And as if you're especially a little bit older like I am, we have to embrace everything, not fight it. Yes, this generation has it easier. I get it, okay? My dad said the same thing to me when I was 16 years old. You have it so easy. You're so entitled. You're lazy. You don't know how to work hard. 30 years later, fast forward, I'm saying the same thing to my kids. Nothing has changed, yet everything's changed. What I would suggest to you, and everybody's business in here is different, so it's kind of hard to get into all the specifics, but just kind of think at a high level. The John Deere commercial says, it's not how fast you mow, it's how well you mow fast. It's not how fast you mow. It's not how many customers we take care of. It's not how many clients we take care of. But it's how well you take care of them. It's not how fast you mow, it's how well you mow fast. Put systems into place. Pals to run 200 cars an hour through a drive through does not happen by magic. It does not happen without them hiring the right person and training them so well they can't get it wrong. So think about how we can take care of our customers better. I would argue that in most of your businesses in here today, there are two key drivers. It doesn't matter if you're a restaurant, a personal services company, in healthcare, employee friendliness and timeliness of the experience are probably the two key drivers in your business success. Are the people that you're customers or clients engaging with friendly to them? And does whatever you promise happen on time? In my case, I'm a sandwich shop. It needs to be fast. If I'm a full-service restaurant, it doesn't need to be fast, but the appetizers need to come out at the right time, and the entrees need to come out, and the check needs to be ready at the right time. Or if I order something from Amazon, what happens when you don't get it on time? Or FedEx, and you're livid. And I can imagine being at FedEx going, we deliver 90 million packages a day. We missed one, okay? <laughs> what one did you care about, though? Yours, that one. I've seen this in businesses. Five on employee friendliness on a scale of one to five versus four. Doesn't sound like much, but the difference in overall satisfaction. If you get a five on employee friendliness versus a four, 91% of them will give you a five on overall satisfaction, intent to return, intent to recommend, versus 37% will give you a five if the employee friendliness factor is a four. A four employee friendliness is still pretty good. Five, though, is making them feel special, making them feel unique, and timeliness of the experience is the same way. If you nail timeliness, you're gonna nail everything else. So as you think about in your business, and again, everyone's different, what are those things that I can do at a five level? The way I always explain it to people is this. If I had a glass of ice cold water and I put a thermometer in there and it said 40 degrees and I threw some more ice in there and it said 33 degrees, the average person wouldn't know the difference between 40 degree water and 33 degree water. It's very cold. We've done, tried to move seven degrees, which in business, to move our business a lot and the guest or the customer or the client never notices, Nothing happens in your sales and you think you're wasted. But if we find the one degree things that matter, what happens when water goes from 33 to 32? Do you notice the difference? Yes, you do. Why? It's became, it changed form, right? It, it went from water to ice. What are the one degree things you can do differently that your customer or client will notice? Focus your attention on moving something one degree instead of trying to move it this far and nobody notices. 
I always use the analogy of Chuck E. Cheese. You could serve a Morton's steak in a Chuck E. Cheese and people would still go, it's just okay. Why? Why doesn't the food taste good at Chuck E. Cheese other than the obvious reason I know you're thinking of right now? But if, if, you, were, if you got a Morton's filet mignon at Chuck E. Cheese, why would you say it's just okay? The atmosphere in there is horrible to have a great dining experience, right? <laughs> they could work on their food quality all day long, and guess what the customer is going to say? Meh, doesn't matter. Dive into your business and look at what matters. Go through every interaction point that you, your product, and your people, and your facility have with your customer or client and define what they are and how to do those at a high level. When you walk out of the restroom in my restaurants, the back, on the back of the door it says, should I shake your hand? I only do this in the men's room because I know I don't need to do it in the ladies' room. But what am I trying to get that person to think? Make the guests say, wow. Every interaction that we have. Define every interaction point in your business because if you don't, how can you train your team to do the things at a high level that you would do when you're not there? I go into my restaurants all the time and they go, oh, you must be the owner. Why do they think I'm the owner? Because I'm way older than they are? <laughs> we're, acting, we're acting a little bit differently than our staff is, right? It's funny because what I hear most of the time is, oh, you must be the owner. I say, only if you like it, okay? But I said, oh, really, why, why do you think I'm the owner? They said, because you're never here. I don't see you here that often. What is that telling me? This person is coming into my restaurants frequently when I'm not here. Is that a good thing for me? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Systematize everything. Make it replicatable. I am here. You guys are taking one, one day, day and a half out of your schedule. I'm here for three days. What do you think my, my employees think I'm doing right now? Sitting at the beach drinking margaritas. I am not. All right? But I have full faith that they will take care of everything because we have the mission, because we have the systems in place. There's a saying in Texas, trust everyone but brand your cattle. <laughs> I trust my, you got to put that brand on them. They have to know what they're supposed to do. The other thing I would tell you, once you define all the interaction points, is create some non-negotiables. And again, it's going to be different for everybody because your interactions with your customers are so different. These are just some simple ones that we put up in our business. These are non-negotiable. Give clarity to your employees. How many of you all deal with younger employees, 30 and below? Do you love them? Sometimes, Sometimes right? <laughs> do they know how to interact with people in general? On this, they do. I think most younger people are afraid to look somebody in the eye because they think they're going to get pregnant, right? <laughs> they don't make eye contact. They look down. And if you're in a business where you have customers, and I know some of our panelists that are about to come up here, <laughs> we're very customer-centric. We have to teach some of these basic things. And they have to be non-negotiable because they're basics. How many of you all own multiple locations or multiple operations of what you do? A couple of you all? How many of you all would love to not be in your business seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and let somebody else do it so you can do fun stuff like I do, right? We have to have a consistent experience with your customer. Because as an example, this is a, this is a little confusing. Don't let worries kill you, let the church help. I, I don't think that's quite what they intended it to say, right? <laughs> we know what they meant, but it doesn't really come through clear. This is a great marketing attention getter. <laughs> but if your customers are a little confused about the message, you're going to lose, okay? Mistakes cannot happen in your business. What happens when you make a mistake? How forgiving are the customers and your clients these days? If you've got some trust built up with them, they're understanding. I see a lot of businesses like this, you know, Maui and Orlando, they, they kind of give tourist service. It's like the college campus culture that we had at Columbia. It's like, they have to eat here anyway. They're only going to be here for four years. Who cares? Then they leave. I see it in Orlando all the time. Well, they're just coming to go to Disney, so you know, they're just going to eat here once while they're here. Who cares? 
That's the opposite of what we need to do. We need to get them to come back as many times as they can while they're here. We also need to take care of all the locals because we have a lot of them. And we need to make sure that when they leave, they tell everybody. And that has become so much easier these days with social media and everything else. We can't afford to make mistakes because we know with one mistake, oh, that fun ride doesn't quite happen. Now, I'm going to kind of switch gears here a little bit because I was talking about putting systems into place. Unfortunately, we need humans. So tell me if you have any employees that are kind of like these two morons on this escalator here. Oh, that's not good. Oh, I don't need this. I'm already late. Somebody will come. Anybody out there? Do you have a phone? No. Sorry. Somebody! Hello! There are two people stuck on an escalator and we need help. Now, would somebody please do something? Help! 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 All right, now I know you're watching this and saying these people are absolute idiots, right? But as an example, I, I did not build TJ's Sandwich Shop. I became a franchisee of a brand that was already established. In that case, I bought the escalator. I could have built my own staircase of TJ's Sandwich Shop, but what did I choose to do? Took the route that was already done for me. I got on the escalator that's known as Witch Witch. What do most people do when given the choice between the stairs and the escalator? They choose the escalator, why? It's easier. But what do most people do when they get on the escalator? Stand there and let the escalator do all the work. See, if you've built your own business and you've built a system, most of your employees are just going to want to kind of let the system do all the work. They don't want to get on the... What do highly motivated people do when they get on an escalator? They walk, they run, they want to get to that next level fast. That's where we need to get better at hiring employees. And I know it's very difficult, and I have heard all over the United States, Canada, here... Doesn't matter if it's a mainland or I walked or I drove past a Jack in the Box today and I saw a banner on the drive through sign that said $10,000 sign on bonus for managers. 10 grand. It's bad here, it's bad everywhere. I have a restaurant in Dallas, the average income in the city I live is $240,000. You think their kids need to work? Heck no. I face the same dilemmas that you do. How many of you all are using some of these kind of sites to, hi to fi find people? Good, bad, tough. Recruiting is like fishing, and I'll go into this in more details tomorrow. I live in Texas. I live in Dallas, which is close to Oklahoma. I went to the University of Texas, hook em horns. Do you guys know why Texas is so dry? Because Oklahoma sucks, okay? Gratuitous football joke, sorry, all right? I live eight hours from the ocean. If I want to catch a shark where I live, can I go out in Lake Texoma and catch a shark? No. I could fish out there all day. I could spend all the money in the world. And this is what I see most business owners doing. They don't go to the right place to fish. They don't put the right bait on the hook. They don't get a little professional help to do this. They don't put some chum in the water to attract the right people there. So I'll give you a couple, couple thoughts today, and I'll, I'll kind of go into more detail tomorrow. Because there's a lot of other sites, and I will tell you that the biggest challenge we have as business owners these days is the gig economy. What does everybody like to do in their spare time that doesn't like to work a structure? Where do they go work? Uber, Lyft. Why? They can work when they want. They can work as much as they want. No, by the way, when do they get paid? Essentially, instantly, <laughs> basically the next day the money's there. There are things that you can do to mimic what they do really well and what some of this generation does. We use in the restaurant industry a thing called Shift Gig. It's kind of like Uber for restaurant employees. It's pretty cool. <laughs> when I have a big event coming up, I get a bunch of people from Shift Gig to cover my excess demand that I have for my employees can't cover it. We have to think differently. If you have any C players, how many of you all are short-staffed right now? 
Okay, it's tough, right? It's tough to get applicant flow to come in. It's tough to get those sharks to come up to your boat. But how many of you all are keeping a loser anchor employee because you're short-staffed and you feel like that's better than being short-staffed? You keep the C player, you might as well just put this sign up outside of your restaurant or outside of your business, okay? Because when your customers interact with a below-average employee, they will never, ever, ever send anybody there to come work for you. They will never, ever send anybody to work for you if you have a C player or a loser, okay? I see people put hiring ads out. I saw now hiring ads out. I, I woke up at 1.30 this morning because I'm from Dallas. I just got here yesterday, okay? I've been, I've been like driving around this island. I'm surprised I didn't get arrested. I've been driving around since 2.30 this morning just kind of looking around at places, okay? I'll probably fall asleep here in a couple hours. <laughs> but I see ads like this all over the place, now hiring. I went in the Safeway grocery store a couple blocks away, right to register, it's now hiring. How is that going to be an effective piece of bait for a rock star employee to come work for you and say, oh my gosh, I've got to come work at this subway because, or this Safeway because they're now hiring. This ad is not going to get the right people to come work for you that can deliver the mission, that can perform at a high level. This ad's a lot more effective in creating applicant flow. You'll never take your work home with you. In fact, it'll be illegal. Or make $16.25 an hour doing what most people do for free. What do your ads say? And I'll go into a lot more of these in detail tomorrow. What happens when that applicant finally shows up? Somebody finally shows up. What are you feeling like right now when you, you got an interview scheduled at 1.30 and boom, 1.30 they walk through the door. You, maybe you're doing a phone interview and they actually answer the phone and you talk to them. How do you feel at that point? <sighs> yes. I had four interviews scheduled in one of my restaurants the other day. One person showed up. I'm getting a little passive aggressive. I'm like, hey, Scooter, you had an interview at 1.30. I drove down here from Dallas four hours away. Could you at least give me the common courtesy of I'm not going to be there? Right? It's frustrating. But unfortunately, what most small business owners do is when somebody walks in the door and they can breathe, it's about this hard to get a job. <laughs> right? You know it. You've all done it. I've done it. You're so short-staffed, you're like, oh, pfft. hey, you know what? Can you close tonight? Okay. <laughs> you're hired. Here's the keys. Let's go. I want to go home. You have to do behavior-based interviews. The behaviors you need are different than the behaviors I need. <laughs> you never thought this stuff was going to be this simple, did you? But as an example, if you are in the healthcare profession, or you're in the restaurant business, you're in the personal services business, whatever it is, you need to do behavior-based interviews. Do not ask hypothetical questions. What would you do if you saw somebody steal? Just pitch them a softball and let them give you the answer you want to hear. Because typically what happens is if somebody walks in and we have a good first impression, we just have a gut feel that's good, and we just want to, oh, I'm going to just see, that's all I see. Somebody comes in on the flip side, has... A negative first impression, they could walk on water and you're not going to see it. Make sure your interview questions are behavior-based around the skills that you need for your job. Somebody that would be good in my environment obviously might not be good in your environment. Know what those skills are. Then we need to kind of train those folks. And I would tell you that most small business owners and even a lot of large companies make this mistake. They train people until they get it right instead of training people until they can't get it wrong. Most of the time when we have somebody new here, we train them just enough so they can get it right, and then we walk away, but it doesn't become habit. And when it's not a habit, what happens? They get it wrong. They have to think it takes longer. Can you imagine going to work at PALS and seeing 200 cars an hour come through a single-lane drive through and you're a brand-new employee? They let you make one item and one item only until you can make it fast enough to not slow the train down because you will wreck that train. They train them so well they can't get it wrong. Think about your training. Now, we're small business owners. I actually build training programs for hospitality companies, all right? 
it's a little bit different, but most of you all don't do that for a living. So think about your line of work and go to YouTube and figure out what's already available online that you can use to train your employees. Food safety, job safety, customer service, leadership skills for your managers when you promote that employee up to manager and they really don't know how to give feedback. Almost everything you could ever imagine is available on YouTube. I learned how to fix my lawnmower belt the other day when the self-propel broke. It's real simple. Leverage this. That's where technology has helped us. The mayor mentioned it before. Everything right here is on our phone. Train people so well they could leave, but treat them so well they don't. That would be Sir Richard Branson from Virgin. Train them so well they could leave, but treat them so well they don't. Now, we have a panel coming up here on culture and, and trying to make our employees stay here in just a few minutes. But when you think about rewarding your employees, as business owners, a lot of times we kind of want to keep all the money for ourselves, right? And do we treat our employees the right way? Think about how you can leverage this generation because what is this generation all about? Me. me. Selfie this, right? Let's do that and post this and look at me and look at me and look at me. Drives me nuts because I'm that old man. I, I, I kind of feel like that old man on the porch sometimes. Ah, oh, this generation. But I've learned to embrace it because this generation is incredibly powerful. They are incredibly smart. They're incredibly adept at technology. We just have to deal with how they're different than us. And what I, I always do to my, when I explain to my employees, I say, look, I don't want to treat you like four-year-olds. I know you live on this thing. You got to have this all the time and those kind of things. So here's my deal. You give me 110%, so with the 10% of the time you're on your phone, I'm going to call it even. 110 minus 10 is 100. I pay you for 100% of the hours you're here, I just want 100% effort. Because at the end of the day, whoever just texted me, okay, as a business owner, I would guarantee you I'm on my phone more in my restaurants than my employees are. And I can't say do as I say and not as I do. So I want to create a mutually beneficial relationship with them. Hourly pay, if you have hourly employees, is really counterproductive to business ownership. When you think about it, because we want it to be busy or slow as business owners busy. What do the hourly employees want? Slow. Doesn't matter to them. So we have to figure out how to reward our employees. Here's a couple things that I would tell you to do, and we'll delve into this more tomorrow. First, I don't believe in raises frequently. I would rather do bonuses and incentives because if I give somebody a raise, is their performance going to change? Nope. I gave all my employees in a raise a dollar an hour one day. I used 250 hours a week in that store. What did I do to my P&L when I gave every employee a dollar raise? I, I lost $250 a week, right? They were all happy for like one paycheck. And then what did they say to me? Hey, when did I get my next raise? I'm thinking to myself, okay, I, grew, we, I started making $335 an hour when I worked. That's how old I am, right? And I got to pay these kids $10 an hour in the, in the in the mainland, in Dallas, where minimum wage is still $7.25. What's your average wage around here? That's minimum, right? It's probably hard to even hire people at 10.10, right? So we created a recognition currency. My company is called Smart Restaurant Group. We actually give them these business cards. I carry them around, and we use those for recognition currency. So when they do something great, boom. Somebody does something above and beyond, makes the guests say, wow. They get these cards. In my case, they're worth a quarter. They may get 10 cards, 20 cards. But that's how we get them to buy into what we're doing. Hey, TJ, I need more hours. Why? I got bills. You're a business owner. You have bills? If you ask your employees how much profit you make off every dollar in sales, what are they going to tell you? All of it, right? 90%. A&W and restaurants, they just use a poker chip. They're worth a dollar. I let the employees save these up for whatever they want, whenever they want, because I learned the most effective incentive is the one they want. I love to play golf. That would get me jazzed to work harder if somebody said free round of golf, okay? Most of my employees, if I said get a free round of golf, big deal. Somebody comes up to me and says, hey, get a free Starbucks card. I don't like coffee. The most effective incentive is the one they want. So we let them save up for whatever they want. 
we also give them a fraction of the action. And you can do this on sales or you can do this on profits. My business is a sandwich business. Catering is huge. Okay, so what I did with my employees is I said you get 10% of any order during my slow times of the year, I give them 20% of the order. Not every employee really gets into this, but my smart ones start looking for opportunities to make more money. Sarah down there at the bottom called me. We made a video, one, one minute long, called Sales Radar. Pay attention to your customers. Lanyards on, name tags, uniforms, those kind of things. She calls me up excited one day. She says, I just got a $3,000 order. I said, really, how'd you get it? She says, well, this guy came in. It was, teacher pre it was a year ago because teacher appreciation <laughs> was yesterday, as a matter of fact. And this teacher came in with a lanyard, and she started talking to them and ended up feeding a high school debate tournament. And I gave her $2,950. That's the order of $295. The order was $2,950. Now, as I write that check to her, I'm really, as a business owner, going, maybe 300 bucks? She makes $10 an hour? But think about this for just a second. How much money would I have made if Sarah had not talked to that customer? Zero. I would have paid zero. Would you pay $295 to your employee to get you $2,950 in business? All day long. All day long. When this happened, my business partner at the time said to me, hey, let's get one of those big Happy Gilmore checks and send this out to our employees so that they see this really does happen. So I, I, this, is, this is a true story. This is $44 from bigcheck.com with my logo on it. I am a cheap business owner. That is the same check in every picture. It's dry erase, okay? So. All right, 44 bucks. Come on, I'm with you guys. I'm one of you, all right? We took the picture. I gave Sarah the $295. Yes, I grossed it up and put it on her check and all that, but I gave her $295 net. I thought that was going to be what it was all about. You know what she says to me? Can I have the picture? Because why did she want the picture? Put it on Instagram, put it on Facebook, put it on her brag montage. Old guy that doesn't do all that stuff would have never thought about it. So I said, deal, as long as I can use this picture in my recruiting ads. So my recruiting ads say hourly incentive pay instead of now hiring. Makes a big difference. You want them to build your sales or save some of your costs? First of all, you have to have the right person. Charles Barkley, NBA announcer, said at the slam dunk contest a couple years ago, Gerald Wallace, I still remember from the Charlotte team, does a dunk, wasn't very good. He thought he was cool. He's chugging this Gatorade. Barkley gets on the PA system and he says, hey, Gerald, Gatorade doesn't help people that suck. <laughs> now, what does that mean to us? Incentives will never get the wrong person to do the right thing. Incentives will never get the wrong person to do the right thing. Gatorade won't help those people that suck. This will not fix your worst employee. This will take your good employees and make them above average. It will take your great employees to the next level. Now, this next one's a little controversial. I think a lot of people don't believe they should train their employees on profitability. I would argue and I would beg to differ. Okay, as a business owner, we teach our employees that orientation and we reinforce with them every month how much money this restaurant makes. You may not get into every single detail, but what I found is most of my employees thought people made 90% profit on every sales dollar that came in. And we had to explain to them, no, we don't. And some people might, I'll give you an example. My busiest restaurant makes $120,000 in profit a year. Okay, it does about $600,000 in sales. I have two charities, as I mentioned earlier, that make, I got to write a check out of the 120 that I got from that one to the other stores, okay? And they say, well, TJ, why do you share? Don't you think that's a little weird that your employees know that this store makes $120,000 a year? And to me, it's a very easy discussion. Hey, I spent $350,000 to build this restaurant. So yes, I'm making $120,000 a year out of this place. But how long is that going to take me to get back to zero? Those of you guys who are good at math, how long is it going to take me? Three years. Now, all of a sudden, you ask the employee, hey, do you want to put $350,000 into one of my restaurants? And you get zero for, you get, it's going to take you three years, if you're lucky, to get the money back? Because this, to me, profitability is like the tube of toothpaste. You know, when you have a, what's the proper portion of a tube of toothpaste? How much, I mean, how much do you use when you brush your teeth? The size of a, a pea, 
Yeah. What happens when the toothpaste is full? How much are you putting on your toothbrush? You're globbing it on. What happens when there's almost none left? What are you doing? You're doing it right. See, when your employees think there's plenty of money where that came from, they, they don't have any concept of what they're doing. When they understand, my employees in my two stores that lose money understand we lose money. They know, and you know what? They care about every single penny because they know I'm writing a check to keep them employed. Now, the last one is marketing, and we're about to bring up the panelists here. I know we've got Google coming. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this tomorrow. But as a small business owner, we battle the big guys. It's tough. We don't have the, the marketing resources. We don't have the brand recognition. Just understand, you have to have a sales radar. You have to be looking for the opportunities to make connections transactionally, interactionally, owning the local community, and out in the digital space. Every time you're interacting with a customer, you need to be looking at how can I get them to tell somebody else? How can I get them to refer? How can I get them to spend a little more and feel good about it? What else is going on outside there? And then you need to be involved in the community because I heard all these numbers from the mayor today and the, the development committee today. People love to buy from people they trust. You're not the big chain. You're not the big corporate behemoth. You are that neighbor of theirs that makes a big deal. So as I wrap up here, and I'm going to bring the panelists up in a second, I want to see if you guys paid attention, okay? No more gorilla videos. Everybody just make the okay sound with your right hand, okay? Just, just make the okay sound with your right hand, all right? Now gradually just bend your elbow, bring this, the okay sign toward your face, put it on your chin. Now what did I say? Put it on your... What are most of you doing? <laughs> See, it doesn't matter what you say you're going to do here. It matters what you actually do when you get back. So hopefully you've got a few ideas to behave a little differently. All right? Yes, no? Yes. Simple but not easy. Simple but not easy. What I want to do, if you guys can just grant us about two, two minutes here, we're going to get, kind of get the stage set up. I've got a couple panelists. We're going to do a panel on employee incentives, so don't, don't go anywhere yet. This is not a break, but let the, our panelists come up here to the stage.